pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture on increasing profits, income through non-corruption. I'm very pleased to have for this event, Dr. Burger Scheidlin, who is gonna give his lecture and tell us about his experience in the prevention of corruption and the broader sphere of the prevention of corporate crimes. To give you a very short introduction, Dr. Burger Scheidlin is the executive director of the International Chamber of Commerce of Austria and the leading specialist in the broader sphere of the prevention of corruption, organized crime, prevention of money laundering, and I would say what can be broadly described as a sphere of business and ethics. In this sphere, he has been in the past consulting and advising various international and national corporate representatives and, and INGO representatives in their attempts to implement anti-corruption measures to prevent money laundering and to set up clean businesses around the world. We were just talking a little bit about Dr. Burger Scheidlin's experience in the former Soviet Union in Central Asia. And he told me that he has been already to Uzbekistan, to Kazakhstan, to Turkmenistan, not yet to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. So there's still some, some, some room for improvement. I'm sure maybe one day we will be able to invite him over. For now we have, since times dictate, an online session, and I'm very happy to have him giving us his, sharing with us his experience. Um, Dr. Burger Scheidlin, welcome to the OEC Academy and welcome to our show, uh, small event. This has been made possible by one of our own, Kodir Kolir, an alumnus of the Academy from 2014, who has since his graduation become a specialist in the broader sphere of anti-corruption himself. Um, he's so far the only, or at least first from what I read, uh, also graduate of the International Anti-Corruption Academy in Austria, and has been an adjunct professor at the Webster University in Tashkent, where he's teaching in the same sphere, introducing and educating others in the benefits one can gain when engaging into corrupt free practices of business and organization. Kodir, thank you so much for initiating and suggesting this event to us. We are very happy to have had the opportunity to following up on it. And I hereby welcome you both, Dr. Bogashadim, Kodir, and all the participants and wish us all very exciting one and a half hours. Kodir, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walters. Um, welcome, <clears throat> our distinguished guest, Dr. Burger Scheitlin. Uh, before we move on to the heart of the uh, discussion, just a brief overview of what corruption is. Um, there are many definitions of corruption. In everyday life, in uh, politics, this is about the total, everything bad, I mean, in the long run. Uh, which is why life is not what it should be or what we expect. <clears throat> Universally, um, it explains basically, in a broader term, uh, corruption explains the discrepancy between the expected and what we experience, between the ideal and real state of affairs. But we stick mostly with the definition by Transparency International. It explains that corruption is an uh, abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Take a bribery, just a quick example, for example. It, comes, it, it involves uh, quid pro quo, like we say in sociology, the exchange of some kind of personal benefit um, for, um, in the exchange for the abuse of power. So how do we know how much of the corruption uh, measuring corruption is very tough. Even so far, for many uh, decades, uh, we know it's a, a new, a fairly new concept of corruption. But usually there are three methodologies to measure corruption. One is to know how much the abuser gains. Second is through identifying lost value. And finally, the frequency. How frequent 
is this abuse of power for uh, personal gain uh, rather than the reasons usually. Of all these three methodologies, the one that has been measured the longest, and I would say the most accurate measurement is frequency. And that is shown by um, Corruption Perception Index published every year by Transparency International. So why worry about corruption? Costs of corruption, the way out from this problem and why corrupt free clean business is useful and profitable. To get answers to these main questions, I pass the floor to our distinguished guest, Dr. Maximilian Burger scheitlin Thank you very much, Cordial. Uh, to start with, I've been corrupt in the past. I started my professional career some uh, 40 years ago in Africa, East Africa, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia. And I was told, do as the Romans do if in, in, in Rome. So I have been corrupt myself and I pushed other people to bribe. And then I came across a Sudanese company, went around the market and said, we never bribe. And I said, well, are, they, are these people mad? How can they make business without bribes? And then I watched them and I realized they made higher profits than all the competition, meaning the average corruption margin was from 20% there. 10% the owner put in his own pocket, so he had higher profits. 10% he reinvested in a wonderful, excellent after-sales service so that all his machines brought into the market were serviced within 24 hours. In the end, because the competition didn't do so, uh, the, the, the machines serviced by this guy where and a standstill of let's say 10 days an average a year of the competition three months a year and even the most corrupt uh bribe takers realized well if the factory is not working they're not making money it's a loss so this guy made considerable business without any corruption only of his own making in a sea of highly corrupt uh, environment <clears throat> so it's possible and that changed my mind and my um, attitude. <clears throat> to give you some examples from the macro side and from the microeconomic side. Okay, let's go to the macro side and let's go to Congo in the heart of Africa. Uh, many years ago, the road from Kinshasa, the capital to the port of Matadi, which is 370 kilometers, was just a dirt tramway road. And, um, a truck needed an average of one day to master this. And then came a brilliant idea. Let's have, have a new tarmac road with an asphalt layer and concrete level on the, on the top. So they done it uh, at the high cost, uh, but they didn't put, uh, they built a fantastic top layer, but not the underground, not enough gravel and so on. So for roughly half a year, trucks could travel at high speed for five hours, the whole road. And then the asphalt, the concrete started to crack. Two years later, a truck from Kinshasa to Matadi took four days. And as all these concrete blocks sticked out and so on, at much higher cost than before. So due to corruption, not so the construction, and the costs increased dramatically. We'll go to Turkey. Some 20 years ago, there has been a big earthquake outside Istanbul in the um, industrial area. Houses collapsed, some 17 people or so died. The, it, uh, the Turkish laws were all perfect, but there have been a few baddies, some corrupt people in the construction, and not enough steel, not enough good cement. That's why the house is cracked. Now, if you would go uh, into the whole thing with a standard legal uh, approach, you would say, okay, um, who were these few people who benefited uh, from the corruption of, let's say, $30 million distributed somewhere? 
you would imprison them, put them in, uh, and say, okay, in addition to, I don't know, 10 years prison sentence, you will have to repay the 30 million. Is that the true cost of corruption? I'd say no, because the houses have to be rebuilt. If you rebuild houses for 17,000 people, that might cost you, I don't know, I'm not a construction engineer, $200 million, $300 million, anyway, far more. Is that the true cost of corruption? Not yet. 17,000 people dead. And aside the human cost and, and, and desperation, there's an economic cost. Uh, the Nobel, Pris, uh, Nobel uh, Peace Laureate, uh, Joseph Stiglitz of the US, made a calculation on the Iraq war. And how much does a soldier, 18 year old, 20 year olds, who is wounded or dead in the Iraq war cost the US economy? And he said, well, every worker on the construction site in the US at the car factory like General Motors, he will have to contribute something like $15 million as value added over his lifetime. It's not his salary, but it's the value added he generates. Now, salaries are in, the, in, in Turkey are lower. Let's assume just a, a, a number. 5 million over a life, uh, over life period. If you multiply uh, 5 million by 17,000, you get a loss for the economy of $18 billion. Okay, you might say children don't work, wives don't work. Well, if you just say, take the, the, the uh, man's population, it will be still be some 40, 50 billion dollars. And with this, you will see a corrupt country will never be rich. Never, ever. Let's go down to the hands-on leveling companies. Uh, let's go to China. I have advised a Chinese manufacturer of fire brigades ladders. In China, the houses are high, might be 20 stories and so on so that the, the, the ladder, if there's a fire, has to go out quite high. Now, in that company, there has been corruption. So the purchasing manager did not uh, purchase the exactly precise, expensive steel. As a result, the fire brigades went out to the, uh, to the, to the fire, pushed out the ladder, and slowly, slowly, air went out through the uh, hydraulics and the whole thing went slowly. Hundreds of people watching, local uh, journalists watching. So that guy, the owner told me, I have a PR problem. I said, no, you have a corruption problem. So I said, well, how is your mathematics? How much time do you take between purchasing of steel and the sale of the final letter to municipalities. He said, well, nine months. I said, let's make a um, bonus system spanning 18 months, double. Then I said, well, how much in your company, how many people in your company are used for repairs of these ladders? He said, well, repair shop, one third of the total. I said, well, if we, with very precise, steel, no corruption. We can take one third of the turnover of this company and increase salaries. So we did. We increased salaries 300% in this company on condition, no corruption, to be paid out 18 months afterwards. And people were very happy. They got a much more money and they got what's important, white money. So they couldn't be blackmailed for this and God knows what. Uh, and the owner was happy because his reputation now was non-corruption, high quality. So he decreased prices at higher quality. So he made more business. Everybody won it. Everybody. I'll go to Brazil. You might have heard that at the beginning of last year, uh, iron ore dam uh, in, in, in Brazil broke. 
the Iron Mine of Valle. And 300 people dead. Uh, the authorities closed down all the IMNs of Valle for reinspection, and there was a lot of corruption involved. It was partly uh, supervised by a German inspection company, but the Brazilians didn't uh, implement the ideas and suggestions of the Germans. Anyway, big thing. So to repair the dam properly would have cost roughly $10 million. However, due to the accident, the uh, stock exchange value of the company was decreased by $19 billion. Is it worth it to not invest 10 million and lose 19 billion? Okay, that's one story. Go to the other end of the globe, go to India. A friend of mine uh, is in the board of directors of an Indian iron ore company. Roughly one year before the accident in Brazil, they had a huge fight in India about should they properly restore their dams for tailings or not. And the director general of the Indian company said, well, I've already bribed the respective uh, public authorities, uh, officials, we don't need to repair anything. This one, my friend, insisted we do the proper thing. And really, she pushed through the whole change, very much to the disliking of management. Now, come in the Brazilian accident. The Brazilians did uh, sell a lot of iron ore from those mines to China. The Chinese had no supplies anymore. The Indians hopped in, and they could do it because they could prove we are clean and sober. And within uh, two and a half months, the investment of the Indians were re uh, re uh, regained in profits because the, steel pr the, the raw material price went up. So you see, doing the right thing paid off in no time, two and a half months. Uh, slight things, what can, do pe what, what can people do personally? Or, for example, roughly, not quite 20 years ago, I've been in Armenia. Uh, by the way, on OECE uh, uh, management. And there, I was kind of taken in by the Armenian Importers Association, who complained bitterly about high corruption at that time at customs. And my first question has been, well, how long is the delay at customs? And they said, well, between three weeks and six months, an average of three months, the goods stay in customs. My second question has been, well, how much does a customs officer earn? They said, well, something like $30, $40. My third question was, and how much does this low level custom officer need to feed his babies? They said, well, $90 and $100 a month. I said, well, why do you complain? That guy has to steal. He has to be corrupt. And I said, well, no, 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 we have to get down the corruption. I said, well, why don't you, as an importers association, <clears throat> pay the difference? I said, oh, we are a poor organization. We just can't do it. I said, well, you probably have not made the right um, calculations. You all have one guy going out and bribe. How much does he cost in salary? He bribes. How much is that money? You have prepaid the goods three months. At that time, 18% uh, interest. How much does it cost you in interest? Second, because you know things come in late. Uh, you have a bigger warehouse with a lot of things in it. Multiplied by 18%. Plus, you have probably built a bigger warehouse to house all this. So how much does it cost you all of the association to finance this? And I said, well, I guess roughly one third of this money should go to, <clears throat> to the customs official through an official contract with the Ministry of Finance Customs Authorities and two thirds of this money, higher profits for you. 
on condition, customs clearance an average of two days or whatever. They said, brilliant idea. I said, okay, I come back in 10 days. Let's discuss it further. Make your homework. So after I came back 10 days later, I said, well, what's the calculation? I said, well, we could pay every customs official between 100 and two, 150 and 200 dollars each month. I said, wonderful. That is increase of salaries by five times. Fantastic. And that legally. And I said, Let, let's go into the DT details and let's talk to the ministry. I said, no, we don't do it. I said, why not? And in the end, one guy kept up and said, I'm the best briber in the country. If my competi competition can customs clear as quickly as I can, I go bankrupt. No, we won't do it. So you see, there was a resistance on the one hand from business. On the other hand, you realize how much money was in the, in the economy, how high salaries could be paid if just properly allocated. And it's not only the increased money for salaries, potential salaries for customs officers. Now, if goods sit in customs an average of three months, the economy moves very slowly, very slowly. Imagine things come in in two days. The money, spin of money in the economy increases dramatically and everything goes up. And business would be, make much higher profits, even if they give good money, good salaries to the customs officials. So you see potential in the country. Now, I come slowly to, to my conclusions and so on. For me, in the absence of corruption, everybody will get richer. The customs officer, the average public officials, the workers, the employees, the managers, the politicians, businessmen, everybody. I mean, uh, you all come from the Rome of the good old Soviet Union. Look at the differences of salaries in, in 1990, 30 years ago, the salaries in all the, the area was plus minus the same. Now look at, for example, the differences between Russian average uh, salaries, average salaries in, for example, Moldova, and average salaries in Lithuania, Estonia, etc. Giant differences. And why? The difference is corruption or fighting corruption. So the money is there. But if you negotiate days, how much will the bribe be instead of just paying a fixed sum, a reasonable sum, it's time wasted. And this time wasted is not benefiting the corrupt uh, bribe taker, nor benefiting the corrupt bribe payer. It's lost. And if you look at the history of uh, Georgia, I mean, uh, there are different opinions about this guy, Shakashvili, some positive, some negative, whatever it is. However, after he implemented his anti-corruption efforts in 2005 or so, the economy within a year grew by 12%. So it can be done. So, where I'm coming from is I don't want to punish people. The law says you have, you must not bribe. I want to give hope. I want to give future. I want to give, show people that without corruption, everybody can make much more money. And that white and clean and they can't be blackmailed. Uh, to cite a friend of mine, an Afghan banker. He has studied in Kabul made a career in Kabul, he's now roughly 50 years old. And he had a mother who fiercely told him a good Muslim must not steal. And his, his mother hammered that sentence on him. Now, in Afghanistan 25 years ago, the whole, everybody was quite corrupt. And his friends, his classmates from university, made fantastic careers in the military, in government, in banking, in business, God knows how. And it made, because 
they were part of the system. Millions, hundreds of millions, giant money. And that guy said, well, my mother, my mother's teaching, I kept it to heart. I've never been corrupt. So I said, well, how did you feel having a small salary and while your classmates make millions, billions? He said, for the first 20, uh, 15 years, I felt very badly. And I really thought, well, I have to change. I have to just give my mother's teachings overboard. Today is different. Most of my classmates, most of these rich guys, they are murdered, they are blackmailed and have no more money. And I'm now among the one third of the richest of my classmates. And those few classmates who are still richer than I am, they sleep very badly. They don't know when somebody will come to take their money. So I said, I'm very grateful to my mother that she said, a good Muslim does not steal. So, okay, we talked about 25 years. That's a long time. And that guy has been deputy governor of Central Bank of, of Afghanistan. He made good local salaries all the time. He has his house in Kabul. He has his uh, uh, house somewhere in the countryside. He has some small investments and he sleeps very well. So uh, you see, even in a very difficult country, like Afghanistan, things are possible. Or let's say, if, you, if you're very corrupt, you don't know when somebody will come to steal your money. Now, as a next step, I would like to a bit hold, um, come into what uh, Cody will say. And I will lead over to, let's say, mathematics of corrupt people as I see it. <clears throat> let's go to Mexico. A friend of mine lives for a long time in Mexico City, and he is an awfully slow driver. Awfully slow driving his car. He was held up by a policeman, and the policeman said, you have speeded. And that guy from whole heart said, no, I have not speeded. So they went into a fight. And the policeman said, well, if you don't pay now, you have to come with me to police headquarters and they get hammered. And what did my friend say? Oh, I'm happy to come along. What did the policeman say? Get lost. Why? Because the policeman knew if through thick traffic in Mexico City, he would go with my friend to headquarters and then extort him there, he would have to share his profits with his colleagues. Not profitable. Point two, he would lose another, an average of two, three, perhaps four hours away from his unique position at the street corner. He would lose income. Not prof uh, profitable. So he let my friend go. And that is a very point where you have to start with anti-corruption. A corrupt person has his mathematics. In his key um, position, he is a free entrepreneur, making good money from corruption. In his side job, he is a public official of God knows what, which now, the public official side gives him the power, and he uses this power as a free entrepreneur. The problem is that corrupt people, in average, can only keep some 30% of the income. 70% they distribute to others, friends, colleagues, blackmail, whatever it is. So only 30% stays with them. However, if there's a political change, God knows what. They're responsible for 100%. That's dangerous. So clean money is very valuable. And as I've shown with the example of China and the fire brigades ladder, and the possibility in Armenia of giving higher uh, profits to, to customs officials, clean money is very valuable and secure. And that's what people need. And they would 
forfeit part of their high corruption income if they have a reasonable, good, white monetary income. And I think with this, I stop here, and I would like to hand over to Kode Kodiev. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Burger Shadling. Very forensic and uh, uh, persuasive, definitely. Um, you do sleep well and you, they, you do save a lot of money with non-corruption. But uh, here questions comes in, what influences uh, people to undertake corruption? What else should you be looking for to minimize uh, corruption in the organization and in, in, in the wider society? How can you limit the threat of corruption? So I'll do my best to uh, cover this uh, uh, answer, to answer those questions. According to uh, one of the experts in the field, uh, Professor Kudgard, uh, we will usually find corruption where there is uh, a combination of monopoly plus official discretion uh, minus accountability. Almost all the papers about success stories I read, uh, they mentioned that when you pay little to the person with entrusted power and do not reward these people or motivate them as needed uh, for the hard work. And when there is no penalties or there is penalties against the corrupt acts in the organization that are very mild or unserious, let's put it this way, we can expect corruption to uh, develop further. So corruption, in other words, is a calculated crime. Entails major questions like, uh, what, if, what if I bribe or cheat? What happens? How much will I get out of this action, of this crime? What are the risks? And of course, what are the uh, benefits and rewards for this? I believe whether you're in, in Bishkek, whether you're in Tashkent, whether you're in, in Los Angeles or in Beijing or other parts of the world, you will find corruption uh, when someone has monopolistic power, monopolistic authority or a good or service, plus has a discretion to decide whether or not someone gets this service or good minus accountability. Here, I'm not really talking about the people. I'm not really talking about the morality either that much. I mean, it's about the system. Corruption allows when there are a lot of multiple and complex regulations. And of course, uncheckable, unregulated official discretion. Now, coming to the psychology of corruption to the to the economic impact of it, uh, I want you to recall a bit of international scandals of corrupt scandals uh, that dazzled worldwide a lot of people. Um, that I recently read, for example, Russian laundromat case. It's it's old case. Ukrainians missing millions, for example. They both uh, 2014 case, or just a uh, world financial crisis or Enron case in the United States. These, these involve, I have to emphasize, big cheaters. In studying corruption, we have two concepts, basically. Big cheaters versus small ones. In which case do you think big cheaters or small cheaters cause big financial loss? This is uh, the main question pretty much in the research. Maybe it could be surprising but for most of you, but the answer is little cheaters. Those are actually below the radar. Let me bring in a, an example um, of one of the researchers, Professor Ariely's experiment. But the experiment basically conducted with about 30,000 people. People are motivated by giving um, they were given 20 math problems. Within five minutes, they have to solve them. The researchers gave $1 for each correct answer. The experiment has three rooms. The room for shredding, room for examining, and room for cashiers, like where you get the money. For those who solve, get the correct answer, they get it. 
So at the end of five minutes, they are asked to stop and count how many questions they got correct independently without anyone invigilating. Then ask them, uh, take their sheet of paper, go to the next room and shred the paper. Nobody monitors. The test taker sees nobody is watching his correct or wrong answer. So they ask test taker to come back to the main room and tell the examiner how many questions they got correct. So they give him a token so he can go to the next room and caches this token. So what happens is uh, they claim six correct, take six co tokens, go to the next room uh, to cash uh, the claimed money to the next room. Only two meters right there. So now test taker does not know that the shredder shreds on the, the sides of the paper. Main body of the page remains non-shredded. So test taker examined how many questions were solved correctly. What they learned basically uh, was that most of the people reported six, even though they load, uh, solved three or four questions correctly. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, the experiment that was conducted, it's one of the uni uh, universities in the United States, they found that very, very few people who cheated big and were closely observed until the end, but those who cheated less were not under control. If I'm not mistaken, 20,000 people uh, probably were little cheaters and about only maximum 20 big cheaters. When they multiplied, of course, uh, magnitude of economic magnitude is huge. They learned 100 times more money lost in that big cheaters. So uh, there is a notion of rationalization here. That's what I would like to stress out uh, here. I'm, I'm sure we have the managers and business owners and leaders uh, of international organizations here. Think of the office office supplied with a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, with a lot of uh, stuff in the office, like pens and pencils and clippers. You probably spend a few hundred dollars for, for that, maybe every two weeks from your company's budget. And in most organizations, uh, people take uh, some of those pencils and clippers and everything for personal use. But sadly, sometimes they take home even. So you're giving them opportunity in this stance to rationalize. Now back to the experiment with the, with the problems I talked about. What they did is they, instead of three rooms, they experimented with two rooms without the cashiers, without the token involved. Directly when they want to claim, let's say if they sold four, they would like to claim, let's say six or seven, they started in the second experiment, probably they, they said, Instead of four, they said most likely five. That's what happens even in many ex uh, experiments that was conducted so far in the last five years. So the room, the, the distance between the experiment that was held and the room that after they have to go to cash their token creates a distance. So cheating directly for money is tough. When they, there is no cashiers, where there's no, no token involved, the guys that, what I'm trying to say here is the research show, they started cheating less. They directly claimed four solved, they say four, they got $4. Very rarely, they claimed $5. Very, very rarely, they claimed $6 because there is no distance anymore just two meters of distance from the examining uh, the, the place where the examiner was held and the cashier's place, they traveled with the token is only two meters. And that created that distance, created opportunity for them to rationalize. You don't lie for money, you lie for basically token, but it comes, uh, becomes money very quickly. So from examiners, room to the cashier's room, like I said, it's only two meters. So cheating directly for money is tough. 
because you can't look at the I and lie. That's, that's the sense of guilt. Distance created an opportunity for rationalization. What I'm trying to say here is, um, for example, if you buy $100 worth Coca-Cola bottles for your organization for use uh, in the kitchen, or place $100 note on the table of the kitchen, employees tend to use Coca-Cola bottles. They rationalize to use the drink rather than $100 bill. It's better for them to use $100 worth of petroleum for your organization's car to do some probably personal stuff than stealing directly the money from your organization's budget. But both are coming from the organization's budget. Distancing removes people from moral obligations. You can see people have amazing nature of dishonesty. To rationalize, dishonesty is mostly about rationalization. Whatever increases rationalization, uh, cheating or lying, uh, corruption in that organization goes up. Whatever decreases rationalization, cheating or lying, uh, corruption goes down. So that the point is, um, aside from uh, nurturing sense of guilt is one of the points you need to actually attack rationalization in an organization. Um, other things equal, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you to both Dr. Bogashai, Jim Yi, and Dear Kodir for the contributions and for your presentations. Now we actually have this rare opportunity to have both extensive practical experience and academic inquiry into the sphere of anti-corruption. And I would like to open the floor for all our participants to ask their questions and to make their comments. I already have seen on the chat that two questions were asked. The one concerns question of the case of Georgia and its possible um, um, implications for transposition of such experience to Ukraine or Kazakhstan. And the second is about reliable sources which measure corruption. I would, for the moment, maybe give the floor back to Dr. Burger Scheidlin to, to address both this, and maybe then after that to Kodir also in terms of the sources, reliable sources available. Dr. Burger Scheidlin. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgia, what in essence, I mean, there are many, many little facts, but in essence, uh, uh, happened in Georgia that on the one hand, they made a little study of whom, which public employees they've thought of being corrupt and others not. They increased salaries of the non-corrupt by 400% and dismissed uh, an average of 50% of all public employees. In the traffic police, I, I think it has been 90% dismissals. Uh, and they told people, well, if you are corrupt, I mean, I'm exaggerating now, you go to prison, whatever. However, uh, they were very, very interested in getting the non-corrupt ones to get, really get, I mean, excellent, excellent salaries by local standards. And I think it is applicable in, in variations for other countries too. One key point which um, Shakash really did is through the increase by roughly 400% in salaries, he gave hope for the future to a lot of people. I think what I would have done at that time is that I, in the, before I would start this kind of radical and surely not democratic effort, uh, I would have given a uh, lecture throughout the country uh, what are the economics of non-corruption and the economics of yes corruption? And that leads me to the se second question, how to measure corruption. I think from what I've seen in measurements, I'm not a specialist here, these mathematics are all wrong because they measure how much money is being paid in bribes. 
the cash transfer. But as you, I've shown you from the Istanbul earthquake example, the cash transfer there was perhaps 30 million, 40 million, I don't know. But the loss to the economy, we're talking about 40, 50 billion dollars. So there's a giant discrepancy. So I've already years ago stopped trying to measure corruption. It's not relevant because the damage to the economy comes from the indirect effects of wrong or suboptimal uh, decision making. That's where the real cost is. And not by, by measuring how much money goes over the table or under the table. That's not relevant. And uh, a little story, some four years ago, I've been at the international conference and the chairman has come from your part of the world, a Stan country. And I went up to him uh, 15 minutes before my lecture and said, hello, and introduced myself. And he looked at me funnily and said, well, you're an interesting man. He said, well, I don't know. And he went to his table, took my CV, read it again and said, you're very interesting man, but tell me, why are you still alive? And that, and then I answered, well, because I don't accuse you of corruption, but I want to take your hand and show you how without corruption, you can make even more money. He told me, that's not possible. I said, wait 25 minutes and let's discuss afterwards. And he came to me afterwards and said, well, this can work in my stand country. So, I mean, if we had, would have more time, we can go more deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, but for me, the key point is first give hope, show opportunities, show a different, different avenue out because in all your countries, presently corruption is what a culture, but everybody does it. So why, if I know, I mean, let's say the US, the European Union all have come to your countries and said, well, we make compliance and anti-corruption lectures. They all told you, you have to do this and that. But if I would be a, re a, re a recipient and uh, listening in to these Western ideas and said, well, I know my policeman, I know my public prosecutor, and I know my judge is corrupt. Why should I adhere to it? Why should I change and lose money? So for me, the first question is, how can I give mid-term, shorter term, long term, more money, more hope, more stability, and a quiet sleep to my listeners? Thank you. Thank you very much. Kudir, would you like to add? Um, uh, yes, I, uh, I absolutely agree with my mentors uh, and said so that it's about indirect effect of uh, our own decision making, but... Um, Officially, I mean, uh, like I said, there are three methodologies to uh, to see how much corruption is there. It's, it's about uh, to identifying the value lost, about frequency, and um, how much the abuser, the person who misuses the power, um, to identify that way. But again, I, I do rely in most of my research. For example, I, I, the research I conducted, I collected, uh, uh, I saw the correlation with the Corruption Perception Index, with the Human Development Index, GDP, GDP per capita, foreign direct investment, um, and all other development indicators. And I always find Corruption Perception Index, which is about the uh, frequency. The most accurate measurement is, is CPI, and I think this is the one that we rely. But before, uh, first of all, this is very important to understand that corruption is, whether we want or not, first of all, it's a fairly new concept, but again, it's very multidisciplinary. You know, it's one field that collects uh, the measures corruption. But uh, I mostly do research and, and started to involve in the fields of prevention. For example, I, do, you know, in politics, we have to analyze the conflict we have, uh, among others, we have two concepts. To understand where the victims are going, what they want, and instead of also 
asking question where, where they're going is we have to also identify what are they running away from? So I, I do focus mostly on that field. Uh, having said that, when it comes to corruption and measuring and all these, I think it's better to focus on the cultural uh, aspect. Uh, it's more philosoph uh, philosophically, uh, we have a sense of guilt. Let me give you an uh, explanation, uh, just an example for that. For example, if you just go out in this, uh, any cafe or restaurant and try to, the one that is more chaotic and a lot of people, low budget restaurant, I mean, not the restaurant, maybe cafe, try to have some drink, sip, and then leave without paying. Probably nobody cares, right? But if you do research, if you try to scrutinize and understand, um, amazing result is that not many people do it. Probably nobody except that we thought about this right now. Why? Because we all humans have a sense of guilt. If in Denmark, or in, in Vienna, you stop uh, or you're stopped for violating uh, uh, some rules, you probably think 100 times before bribing the police, it's impossible. Because there is a guilt nurtured in this society. But in some really corrupt countries, this is problematic. It has become from the sense of guilt, what I call it went down to the cost benefit analysis. Now you have rationalization. Okay, I think people are doing time after time passes, you know, but sh long story short, I think that's how you can identify where corruption is. And then you, you definitely have to conduct the research. This is the best way. Every country has different scenarios. I do personally do up to measure this, uh, conduct expert interviews, focus group interviews, and of course, uh, different kind of surveys. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm conducting right now, designing a corruption perception index for the higher education sectors in Uzbekistan, and that's what I'm doing. We have to do a research on this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Kodir. We have already more questions coming. One concerns Afghanistan, and the question is how one would work on lowering the corruption rate in a country where, such as Afghanistan, where even for a small job appointment, you have to pay. And uh, Kujafon from Tajikistan asks, similar to that, how one can actually um, um, fight, how can a country which barely pays a low salary for its workers fight corruption? The second question from, from her concerns the corrupt mentality. How can we change that? How can we make people not, uh, uh, not to engage into corruption. And the third is how one can actually motivate youth if everything they see is uh, real corruption. On that I would like also to follow up. That's a very interesting topic indeed. We always say we have a new generation, but what is it that this new generation is actually experiencing every day? And the fourth concerns, um, how can we, the temporal aspect, how can we engage now into stopping corruption? Uh, for a better future if we are stuck in the here and in the present. Um, I give the floor again to respect to Dr. Boga Shaitlin and have Kudir following up on that. Thank you. Well, again, uh, my credo, which I expressed before is, first give hope, then talk about corruption. Don't come in with fighting corruption first. Don't do it. Just show how to make more money otherwise. To go to Syria, to give you an example of two different companies, both mid-sized clothing companies, uh, both having 150, 130 employees. And in the one I was invited into the very, very big room of the general manager, owner of that company. And uh, I was fantastically engaged and hosted and fantastic. And then there's a knock at the door. No reaction from the owner. A few minutes later, another knock at the door. He shouted, what do you want? Then another knock at the door. Okay, so he said, come in. So what happened? A low level guy came in 
and ask you if you would like coffee or tea. At a different company, very nearby, two kilometers apart, the owner sat in a small office in the middle of the factory, a little cubically in the middle of the factory. Two doors, all doors were open, and I was not really invited in with a lot of heart and welcome. I was just sit there and somebody came in and asked a question to the manager. And five minutes later, we were disturbed again. Somebody asked a question to the manager. A totally different attitude. And the first question, uh, the first company asked me, well, how can I bar new imports of clothing from China and Asia? because we can't compete anymore, because uh, we have to pay officials, we have to pay God knows whom. So he was kind of on the full scale of protectionism. Help me, I have to protect myself. The other guy asked me, are we very competitive? How can I send more goods to Europe? Same city, same organization, or same basic organization, same in difficult environment, totally different attitudes. And that's what it is. And I'm sure the salaries the one guy paid was much, much higher than the other. The one was successful on his own, probably not corrupt, uh, in the middle of action, and the other was treating his uh, employees, I judge right now, perhaps as slaves. So in the same country, very corrupt country, you can have to totally different outcomes. And coming back to the, the, the many questions from, from Tajikistan, as I said, I repeat now, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going to this again. I showed you with the uh, uh, example from Armenia. Yes, the salaries are low today, but I showed you what's economically in the in the country, what's there, the money is floating around. It's just not paid out directly, but indirectly with a lot of time wasted in the meantime. And you can't change a corrupt mentality, but you can show him, he said, as I did with this uh, chairman of the conference, I said, don't be stupid. I show you how to make more money without corruption. And he started to listen, more money without corruption. That's why, and, and you're right, people in the, in the stand countries in the area value the today more than the tomorrow and the after tomorrow. But if I tell him already within, I don't know, a month can have a higher salary. Yes, we can do it right now. He will listen and he will start to reflect and, and perhaps change. So not with pressure, you can change, only with hope. you would like to add? Yeah, I will try to generalize a little bit. I, I do agree uh, perfectly. You, uh, when, when part of attacking any culture of corruption must be offering real and better alternatives. If someone tells me not to bribe the official, the bureaucrat in my, for example, community, I need to have a sense that there is another and better way to get my business done. Moreover, a culture of corruption needs to be understood very clearly understood. This is very important. And then uh, you can attack afterwards. I mean, at all levels, not just national institutions um, or I'm just telling you general, in many ways, uh, you can start from the police in your streets, for example. And I also, um, to try to answer the old questions, but then uh, I have to recall a Sim Governor's research uh, who studied the corruption, the phases uh, in uh, Palestine. He basically concluded after the research that uh, corruption is always there. You, you can never end it. It is, it's, it is unrealistic to say we're gonna noodle, we're gonna fight absolutely and root out. It's impossible. It has never been. So basically he says, corruption is in equilibrium. When you know what moves that from left to right, 
yeah, and you need to first up, you have to apply a diagnosis to identify that and then uh, try to control it. Um, and I also have to, again, re-emphasize the importance of nurturing guilt. You have to nurture guilt to the society. This is the first thing. If you cannot succeed, society goes back to the uh, cost benefit analysis. That's where a rationalization comes in. The more rationalization, the more corruption, the less rationalization, the less cheating and dishonesty. And it's also important, very important to introduce uh, fixed, well-structured regulations and attacking conflict of interest. If uh, there is any questions left and answered, I mean, this is like I wrapped up we had um, a further question concerning a topic that has been also discussed very often in different formats here at the academy among the students as far as I remember. And that concerns um, centuries old traditions like gift giving and luxury weddings, etc. that actually one would need to first uh, to prevent from taking place. And the question following up is, is maybe to enforce a Singaporean strategy is something like the Singaporean strategy practical to the cases of the Central Asian states? Mm. Can I come in? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, gift giving. There's an old saying of the former Nigerian president. Um, no, I can't recall his name right now. It will come. He said, gifts are there to be given in public for all to see in the social context, for everybody who can, to see it and approve it. But if the big is too, too big, if the gift is an embarrassment, or if the gift is given under the table, it should be returned. That was Mr. Obasanjo, who was for twice president of Nigeria. He tried to fight corruption he didn't do it to the end, but yes. So the point is, I don't think we should stop the weddings, but the weddings might be there within the, let's say, not overbearing context. Uh, it becomes difficult if it's under the table. If I give money, if, if I have students, like 50 students in my room and uh, gentlemen, ladies, and I said, well, if tonight, after three days of hard work, we have a party, and I bring a bunch of flowers worth $50 to the lady who hosts us tonight, for all to see, I give this lady uh, the flowers. Is that corruption? And I say, well, probably not. It's there for all to see. She will enjoy it. Uh, she has done, invited us, and she probably can't resell it. However, if I give a little envelope with $50 underneath the table to somebody and said, well, do me a favor, this is definitely corruption. So same value, but different attitude. So I wouldn't blast the weddings totally because they are culture, might be, kick the tip, the, the tip of the, the iceberg a little bit. I'm sure there are some exaggerations. Uh, coming back to Singapore. Singapore has been 60, 70 years ago, a dump, a corrupt dump in the swamps. And Lee Kuan Yew, who was no clear Democrat, uh, had very high salaries, but he had salaries for himself. He did not, he has not been corrupt. He accumulated, the Lee family accumulated many millions, dozens of millions, hundreds of millions over the years, but clean and clear and public for all to see. And it was a clear measurement in proportion to management given. It was not under the table uh, for 
let's say a golf course in London or somewhere. And that's a big difference. And Singapore has partly doubled the salaries of Austria. People are extremely well paid there, but they have to perform. And with this in Singapore, you get the best brains, the best brains of the country uh, into the top levels of government and public administration, because the public, top public officials in Singapore will earn more than in banking, more than in finance and industry. So yes, Singapore way is definitely a thing and everybody earns fantastically. And come to come back to an old question which was there on, on the chat, youth. Well, for me, young people who have no hope, who have no hope for the future, they will become radical. They will join whatever radical unrest there is. I mean, we've done it in Europe um, 90 years ago with Hitler. If we wouldn't have a solid economy at the time, Hitler would have no chance. And similar things you have from Syria, the Islamic State, to God knows what. They were the same story. Hopelessness gives a wonderful nurturing ground to radicals of all sorts. Thank you very much. Kudir, would you like to uh, Yeah, so I, I would try to add, um, you know, also that corruption success to, uh, formula of one country, just to add, uh, except that was, will never work um, in the long run successfully in another country because the culture and, and all social level, everything is different. Um, and also another thing to add, um, I mean, I'm, I can't walk into the gum in the same time. There are some questions I'm trying to cover here about punishments uh, for the, when it comes to bribe, big punishments do not work in the long run. That's what I found out. And I did that with uh, studying from different dimensions. For example, um, I have to say that people are not good at um, thinking about the long term long run consequences of their actions. For example, um, healthy dieting. I, I'm still working on it, still researching. Healthy dieting, um, safe sex, uh, texting when you drive. These are the actions as a primary actions that people shows that people, we don't really think about long-term consequences. And the research, the found, the research results that I have so far found, they see in that, uh, in that scenario, people have two purposes in mind, psychologically, I mean, selfishness and honesty. I mean, selfishness, I want to benefit for myself. I want to take everything. And the other side you have inside is honesty. You know, fabulous people get, get some enjoyment out of this uh, doing good stuff. So what happens is in the first thought, you think, you know, either or, but people, again, going back to the <laughs> rationalization, they can do both. They can cheat a little bit and stay still honest. So again, going back to this rationalization, you need to, you know, nurture the guilt and increasing salary, again, will not give you, will not render a, a, a good result in the long run. You have to look at other aspects. What if this public of, is this public official working normal hours? Yes or no, and why? Is this public official having a proper uh, computer to do his stuff? Is he working in a, a place in a nice cabinet or the water leaking out of, you know, condition, work condition. This is the dimension that I'm studying right now and, and, and interviewing Unfortunately, increasing your uh, the salary will not work. In, in, in South African uh, countries, um, I, I have interviewed so far uh, like 10 people and I find out this is different in totally, um, let's say, systematically corrupt countries. See, one theory in developing maybe uh, uh, once in a while corruption is different 
than systemic ones. When you do increase salaries, it will double corruption. And, and the country is facing, for example, poverty trap. So it, it, it's a case, country to country, it depends. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I come here a little bit? Yes. I, I fully agree with uh, Cody and I have some different aspects to it. Salary increases alone, Cody, you're fully correct, alone cannot reduce corruption. You need side measures. And if you look, for example, to South Africa, yes, they increased the salaries, but they did not increase the implementation of the law at the same time. They did not uh, help public officials have a proper uh, seat in government, or let's say a, fu a fully fleshed office, and so on and so on. So what South Africa did was one point only increase the salaries, nothing else. That's not good enough. So I agree and I disagree with Cody on both things. Uh, the salary increase must come in two ways with a lot of side steps, uh, with a lot of side framework, which inc includes the salary increase plus a very strict law, plus a very strict implementation of the law, uh, supervision. So it should be a, the way out there, but at the same time, they act if you don't perform. So you need uh, both things. Then I had a question here from Arya who asks, who says that they found some studies that corruption could lead to economic growth. Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, corruption needs to, leads to economic growth in the short term, yes. So for example, if I get with corruption the permission to set up a factory, Yes, this in the short run will have my factory there and that will uh, produce economic growth. That does not mean that I will be safe as an investor. The more corruption there is in the country, the higher my profits have to be. In Europe, where we believe we have long-term stable government, people invest if the money comes back in 20 years. However, I guess in Afghanistan, if I'm very uncertain of what to do and where the government will come uh, in next, next, uh, next week or so, I might have to get, get my money back within a year. So therefore, my profit margin for the same thing has to be 20 times higher than in Europe. That's where the economics come in. And then my product will be so expensive that the smuggled product might be cheaper in spite of all the costs of smuggling. So in the very short run, yes, a corrupt license might lead to an investment, like, might lead that I set up a factory. But if I have my license through um, corrupt means, I don't know how long this license will be safe? When will the government change? When will be that official change? When will they realize I've uh, received that license through corrupt means and start punishing me? Or just blackmail me, same story. So uh, it's not a long way forward to use corruption to invest. Thank you. Cody, would you like to comment on the question of, of uh, uh, just growth by corruption? Not much to add, and I, I agree with uh, my mentor. Just to add also, uh, just slightly uh, here, um, <clears throat> when it comes to systemic corruption, uh, not once in a while, uh, I do agree. It is, it is good for the uh, microeconomics, not macro microeconomics to, for a short period of time. Um, that to do uh, like a grease in the oil um, because there are things that again it's a matter of justification people don't they justify fully the actions when they don't have nothing to get um, things done but only bribe they do because it is a systemic and everyone is doing 
So, but overall, in the long run, it is bad. It is not good for, for the growth, neither for the development. In the short run, it is useful, but it is really, again, systemic corruption, not once in a while corruption. Thank you. Thank you so much. From what I see, we have um, answered all the questions that were posed, and we are also coming to an end in terms of time. I would like to thank all of you who have participated in today's lecture, and of course, our two speakers, Dr. Buga Scheidling and um, 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 Kudir, Good. for their contributions and for their readiness to answer and engage into the discussion. I think the topic is not nearly exhausted. I saw that Dr. Buga Scheidling has already provided his context for any follow-up questions, and Kudir, of course, is also available for anybody who would like to continue the debate. For now, and in the name of the OVC Academy, let me thank you all for your engagement and I hope we see you in one way or the other for another event in the future in a, a similar um, gathering. Thank you so much and have a nice day and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.